Welcome to Scaling with Disha, the show that helps online entrepreneurs to scale their business to six figures and beyond without the hustle or the overheads. I'm your host, Disha Wadup, and I'll be here each week to remind you that you can do anything you set your mind to. Hello and welcome to another fabulous episode of Scaling with Disha. Today we've got Ashley DeLuca here and I am so excited for this episode. Ashley is my amazing email strategist and she knows all of the stuff. So I am so excited to interview her today. As a podcaster and keynote speaker, Ashley DeLuca is a widely regarded as the go-to source for all things email marketing for e-commerce and service-based businesses. She's been featured on Thrive Global, Funnel Magazine, GoDaddy, Mind of George, and many others. And Ashley will be the first to admit that she's obsessed with the avocados, sea turtles, and email marketing, and won't pass up a good cup of coffee. I absolutely <laughs> love coffee too. So welcome, Ashley. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. I'm super stoked to be here. Yay, thank you for for joining us. And I cannot wait to dive into your mind and pick out apart some amazing tips for our audience to start to implement in their email marketing. So firstly, tell everybody more about you. I know I just kind of introduced you, but that just like touched the surface. So tell everybody more about you. Oh my gosh, 110%. No, and thank you so much. I am seriously so incredibly excited to be here with you specifically today. She is so much fun to be with, guys. So I'm so excited you guys are here to listen to this episode. So yeah, so I'm an email communication strategist. So I specifically focus on working with relationship-first companies in order to be able to create back-end growth and um, recurring profit within the back-end of their business. And the thing about this for me is email marketing is one of of the best channels to really intentionally communicate with your audience. And a lot of times it's overpassed because it's complicated. There's so much tech involved and it's just like, holy guac, like, what do you even say? How do you say it? When do you send it out? And so I just really simplify this entire process and make it super easy for you to create conversations within your email marketing. I love it. And some of the emails that you write and send for, for me and for some of my clients have been amazing. So Let's dive into some tips. If people have no audience, where do they start with building up an email list and how do they get people to open their emails? Totally. Okay. So if you are starting from like ground zero and you're just like, okay, I'm I'm wearing the newbie hat over here. Essentially the very first thing that we want to do is we want to pick a platform. I strongly believe that you should pick a platform that works best with your brain and that will satisfy the needs for your business. And so I have my recommendations. I love active campaign. Um, I love convert kit. I also recommend if you are an e-commerce business that you use Clavio. Um, but at the end of the day, Focus on what works best for your brain. From there, this is when we're going to start to move into the intentional customer journey. And I know, you know, Facebook groups are literally the easiest way in order to be able to collect email addresses that then allow you to be able to fuel essentially this funnel for you to attract those new subscribers. But within this as well, too, it's really about that intentional journey from the very beginning. So often people will join an email list, they'll sign up for a freebie, they'll join a Facebook group with the intention that they're going to receive something. And then they never get anything at all. And they're just like, well, what the heck, man? I thought I was going to hear from you or I was going to get this free guide or this free training. So you want to make sure that your intentions are always very clear in terms of, okay, cool. You get accepted into the group and then you get added into this email list that gives you this free training, this free thing, guide or, you know, whatever. So generally speaking within this process, it's really about making sure you're very clear on those expectations. So let me give you like an actual tangible example. So within your first email, you should be letting them know how often you how often you will be reaching out to them, along with what you'll be reaching out to them about. So sometimes you can just kind of trickle this in terms of with like, okay, so the next email will come into your inbox in the next couple of days, and this is what we're going to be focusing on. This will then allow you to be able to then easily give them that expectation of like, oh, okay, cool. She's going to email me within the next couple of days. I can't wait to learn more about how to monetize my Facebook group, for an example. And so this gives you a great way to be able to move people through and then also get them to get curious about what that next email is going to entail. I really like that step-by-step process that you lay out on like, okay, this is what you're going to receive in the next email. Because often Mm -hmm. I find that people don't anticipate that and they, they get stuck in, oh, I don't know what to write next. And I'll just 
pick something out of my brain and put it to yeah. paper. But having that That's strategy, I think, is really, really useful. How many emails do you think should be in a sequence like that? Oh, my gosh. So the standard for a welcome sequence across the board that you'll actually find is five. But I've actually changed my reasoning to eight. And here's why. Usually, generally speaking, in a welcome sequence, most of the time you're only pitching once within that welcome sequence. And that's in the very last email. You might tease it in email number four, but for the most part, it's like email number five. And the thing is, is I, and I was thinking about this. I was like, okay, cool. Like how often are people going to say yes on that first email, that first sales email when they first see the offer? And I think about myself. I think about my clients. And a lot of times they have to see the offer a couple times. They have to learn more about me and they have to dive a little bit deeper and maybe go into FAQs. And it's not about convincing. Like I'm not here for the convincing factor. It's just about education around the offer. And so that's why I actually move it to eight emails to allow for there to be three emails specifically around the offer, including one that is more so just a reminder kind of like last last minute kind of thing like hey like if you if you're interested in this this is a lot you know i'm not going to email you more about this you know for a while so if you're interested now's the time to be able to book the call fill the application or grab your spot um and so usually five but generally speaking i've been moving to eight email sequences to allow for enough of that selling time uh, that's really interesting, actually, because I think a lot of people, especially if they don't have time to open that particular email or they don't have time to read it, then it is the subsequent emails that are going to make the difference. And I think mm -hmm. coming from a, a social media strategy point of view, having that tanged with your social media posts as well. So like I've been launching at the moment at the time of filming this, where I am posting about what I'm offering, but the call to action has only been on emails. Mm -hmm. And I was testing that process of people seeing all of the value and the content that I'm sharing about the offer, but only having the call to action to book in a call on the emails and working those two together. And yeah. it's actually worked really well. And I've had like five sales calls booked in uh, over the last couple of weeks where I have just been, the call to action is just on email. Um, yeah. And I think you bring up a really good point in terms of with how people actually use email versus social media, because a lot of times people just say, oh, all you need is social. And I was like, okay, we could go into a really long argument about how social is just rented property. But more so than that, you have to think about when people are going on social, why are they going on social? For me personally, I mean, I speak for myself, I'm looking to avoid something that I should be doing. So procrastination, <laughs> but I'm also looking for entertainment. I'm looking for something to consume. And so within that piece of it, that's why I think it's so incredibly important to use your email to actually pair that CTA, as you mentioned, because when people are going into their email, email for me is like a to-do list in terms of, like, okay, what do I need to do with this email? What is this in for me? What do you need me to complete for my clients? Things like that. So the mentality is completely different in terms of with how you approach and how you do things. Yeah, I think that's that's quite funny how you say a to-do list because mine is totally a to-do list, but I also have that spam email address. You, yes. you know what I mean? The ones that you don't really want to read those emails. So you give them that email address where you're like, I'm not probably going to read this email. <laughs> I just had to sign up to get through to the next thing or to buy the thing or whatever it was I was doing. I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not going to look at those. But yeah, my main email box, if I subscribe to you and I'm like, you're going in my main email box because I want to read what you got to say. That is going on my to-do list of things. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So if somebody has a bigger list and they need to engage because a lot of people have a fear around open rates and I get this question a lot, like what is a good open rate? What's a bad open rate? How do I increase my open rate? And if people go, I have a terrible open rate. And I'm like, what is it? 25%. I'm like, this is pretty good. Like <laughs> it's when people go into the email thing and they think I should have a hundred percent open rate or close to. So what is a good open rate and how should people increase their open rates? Oh my gosh, this is a great question. And I also get this all the time as well too, especially from people who may be getting new into email marketing or even if you're like, okay, I've been emailing for a while and nothing's budging or things are dropping and I don't know what's going on. So let me be clear first. So your open rate is actually 50% your subject line and 50% the relationship you have with your subscriber. Because the thing is, is that at the end of the day, when people are going through their inbox, they're either looking at the subject line or they're looking at the name of the person who sent it. And so for 
subject lines specifically, I usually look for about a 30%. Now that is not the end all be all. It is not, you hit the 30, you get the gold star or you drop lower. So you get an X. Like it's not anything like that because each and every single email list is completely different. You know, the people who are on your email list are completely human, right? So within that as well too, people aren't necessarily opening every single email all the time because things definitely do get missed or you select all and you're like i'm not dealing with my inbox today like things happen right and so within this i really really focus on the relationship side more than just like trying to figure out the best subject line because for me it really comes back to those relationships and so if you are finding that your subject or your opener rate is like tank and you're just like i don't even know what to do this like it seems like a waste of time the first thing that you'll want to do is you'll want to clean your list most of the time, you probably have a bunch of stagnant people who, you know, have sent your emails to spam, have not been opening them. They go into a folder and just never get looked at. So anybody who hasn't been opening your emails in the last 90 days, you should try to re-engage with them with a re-engagement sequence. That will automatically help boost your open and click rates because you're requiring them to do something, to take action, to stay on your list. And then once that's complete, like after you go through and let's say you have 90 people who still haven't re-engaged with you, what you can do is then you can can download them, save them because you can use it for a lookalike Facebook audience. Um, and then what you can also do is then just download it, delete it, and then that will automatically, the next time you go through the process of sending out an email, um, you'll automatically have a, a boost because you just removed a bunch of people who are no longer interested or weren't opening your emails. So that's the first thing. Um, and then the second thing is, is that conversational email uh, subject lines always win. So my best subject line ever is just, hey, that is literally it. Because the thing is, is that I think people are getting to the point where they're just so tired of just three surface level tips or three ways to do something like, listen, I already have all the knowledge. Like, give me a story. Give me something I can actually sink my teeth into that I'm actually interested in that actually helps me um, as opposed to just staying surface level. So those, those are kind of the basics of your open rate. And when you really get the open rate down, that's when your click rate's going to improve as well too. That's really interesting. The way you said, Hey, is it one of your top things? Cause one of my top open rates is, are you okay? And, yeah. <laughs> and people always respond. It's like a really short email and people always respond to it and like, oh, thank you so much for asking. I'm like, no worries. It's an automated email, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's the, but you know, the thing is though, it's the intention behind it because you truly do mean that even yeah. if it, it is automated, your intention is still pure. Your intention is still, no, I actually do care when you reply back to me. Like, no, I'm so, I'm so happy for you, Susie. I'm so great. Or so thankful that things are good for you. Or I'm so excited about this new launch you're doing. You know, it's very genuine. Yeah. And so that's, I think that's the biggest thing is that when your intention is in check, then it doesn't seem transactional or sleazy or kind of gross at all because the intention is pure. Is there some things that will always go into spam? Because like on social media, for example, there are posts that people are like, oh, you can't say this because it's going to end up in, in not being seen by the algorithms and this and that. Are there things that are like no-nos in emails in your subject line or in the copy of your emails? Yeah, so the actual terms change quite often in terms of with what's kind of not or considered not acceptable, you know, but generally speaking, I mean, to be completely honest, I don't really even review the list or look at them or try to stay up to date with them because generally speaking, the language that I use is very much so as if I was talking to a real person. And so I don't, I'm not, I don't have my sleazy car salesman hat on say, oh yeah, it's only 10% down. Like the, the, the phrases and things that would usually get trigger to go directly into spam usually aren't words or things that we would probably say together anyways, especially when we're very heart centered or very relationship first. Um, and so within that piece of it, I think it's also really incredibly important as well too, um, to really take a look at your email marketing provider. Cause a lot of times your deliverability, it's 50% on you and 50% on your provider. So looking at your email marketing provider to see what they do when it comes to deliverability, keeping you off a of blacklist and stuff like that is also really important um, to helping you keep out of the spam folder. Yeah. Does it have something to do with your server as well? Can your server play an impact on that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So essentially the server that you're assigned to within your email marketing platform can have, or I don't necessarily think it's the server, but it's more so of like the IP 
Anyways, this is getting real techy over in my brain. <laughs> um, but basically, um, Glock apps, I'll just give you guys the shortcut here to this. So if you go over to Glock apps, um, it's a free tool that you can use. You get three reports for free. You can run the report to be able to see, you know, what, what IP address are you on? What server? Like all of those pieces. What is your sender score? You get all the information, including all the way down to each and every single um, email like inbox. So like, is your emails directly going into spam when you send them in Gmail? Yes or no? Are they going to the promo tab? Like you get all of that information to be able to empower you to be able to specifically make updates, to have conversations with your email marketing provider and all that really fun stuff. I love that. What was that word again? What was that website again? Glock apps. Yeah, Glock apps. Yep. Okay. So, yeah, that's amazing. I'm going to go check yep. that out for sure. Because I heard that like info at and the, the generic sort of mm -hmm. email ones are going into those spam folders, which I've been looking at recently. And I'm like, oh, I need to change my email address and all of that jazz. Do you know much about that? I know we've spoken about it privately, but share with the audience. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So there's definitely been a change. And I think the biggest thing within this is that, you know, spammers are getting, you know, they're going to happen. Right. And so a lot of times they kind of ruin it for the best of us, you know, by using an info or a contact or things like that. So I think the most important thing for you to do is to take a look and just have a discussion with your email marketing provider because some of them are like no it's totally fine like we'll send emails through it's not a problem others are like no like that's not going to work for us so have a conversation with them when you're setting it up or if you're looking to change and be like hey this is what my email address is will this work do i need to change it um because yeah some of them are like no like it has to be this kind of email address structure for it to work or for you to get approved within their account system so just have a discussion i think that's the most important part is just communicating communicating with the email marketing provider that you have. Um, most of them are super open. You know, they, they only make money if you're successful on their platform. So they're there to help you. Yeah. And that's quite important because I saw somebody, another coach recently who was talking about leaving a certain email marketing platform because they kept using money terms and monetary terms in their subject lines or in their email copy. And they were getting blocked and going into spam filters from their yeah. email platform. Um, so they were looking to change from that point of view. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I haven't heard that before. Have you seen that often? I mean, a lot of times when people are switching, it, it can be because of deliverability. A lot of times it's just in terms of with function, in terms of with, you know, this, this system isn't really working well for my brain. It doesn't make sense. Like for me personally, Entreport is confusing as fudge cycles in my brain. Like a lot, when I go into Entreport, I'm like, oh my God, I get it. I totally get it. Um, but it just doesn't make sense in my brain. Um, and so I, it's just a lot more so about function at the end of the day over anything else. Yeah, that makes total sense. I think I like active campaign and you know, I use active campaign and yeah. I get confused when I go into MailChimp if some of my clients have MailChimp <laughs> and I'm no. like, oh my God, where is this button gone? Why do they make this so hard? Yeah. <laughs> like you should just move to active campaign and it works so much easier on that platform. Seriously though, seriously. <laughs> but it's just so frustrating. Okay. What other things do people need to know about emails? What should people send and how often should they be sending? Yeah, so I like to take the approach of jab, 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 right hook by Gary V. Um, and essentially the concept in like email terms is like value, 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 and then you ask for the sale. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to wait until that fourth email in order to ask for the sale. Please customize this based off of your launch schedule, based off of what you have going on. And you can even add PSs in that then lead to your consultation, to your offer, to your form, and stuff like that as well, too. I like to tell people that they need to send as many emails as they can actually do, whatever is reasonable for you. So if it's weekly, perfect. If you're like, girl, my schedule is cray cray. Like there is no way I can send more than an email a month right now with what I have going on. That's totally completely fine. Whatever, I would rather you send one really good email than four crappy emails. Um, and so that that's usually the gist of it. Um, if you have a... I will add this. So if you have a list that's over 3,000 people, you will want to consider doing two emails a week, but you'll want to segment them um, specifically based off of your audience or based off of the offers that they are interested in. So that way you can then start to use your list a little bit more effectively as opposed to just like hitting send all to your like entire list because it's not as effective that way. Yeah. Oh, that's a really, really good point. So when do you think you should start adding those segmentations into your list? 
Um, so right away, it's really incredibly important to have a basic one set up of who has swiped their credit card with me and who hasn't, right? So it could be non-clients versus clients, non-buyer versus buyer, use the language you would like. Um, but it's really important to actually separate the two and to be able to start tracking from the get-go people who have purchased from you. Um, and also, if you can, also tag for what offer they took advantage of. For me personally, I just have it based off of just like clients because most people work one on one with me. Um, so the container is pretty similar in terms of what it, what it is. Um, but especially if you have like an ascension model or you have a value ladder where people can go into different offers at different price points, it's really important to tag them based off of the offer they get. So that way you can then target that specific group of people for your next offer or for the next step. And is there an automated way to do that? Or do you have to manually go in and be like, new client, I'll go find them in my list and that tag? <laughs> yeah, so it depends on um, how you manage your stuff, right? It's very much so system based. So uh, for me personally, I use Dubsado. And what I do, um, it's not very, like I said, I just take them based off a client. Um, and so essentially, once I receive a payment in Dubsado, it'll take their email address, put it over into ConvertKit for me, and then tag them as client. Now, the reason why I do this specifically, um, because generally speaking, you do have to let people know that like, oh, you're going to be going over my email list. And, you know, the thing is also, too, if someone's like a one-on-one -on -one client, I'm not necessarily like, here's all my marketing emails. I actually do that to take them off of my list, to take them off. So that way they're not getting all of my marketing promotions and emails and stuff like that. Um, that's specifically why I do it. And then um, I've never sent an email specifically out of my email list for clients only because everything is done one-on-one, -on -one, very much so like personal email based. Um, but that's, that's how I do it. I use Zapier to be able to connect the two um, to make it super simple. Ooh, I think I have that set up maybe, but I don't have them tagged. That's something, that's a new job for me to do. <laughs> yeah. And it's super easy. And, you know, depending on if what your business is, what you have going on, you can integrate your, you know, shop, or if you have digital downloads into what you're doing, it just is very extremely custom based off of like, okay, Ashley, I have this system and this email marketing system. Let's marry the two. And I'm like, all right, let's see what we can do. <laughs> yes. I love it. Okay. So what should people be uh, clicking through to. So if they've got a CTA, is there a specific way to put that CTA in the email? Is there a specific way where place they should be sending them? I know some people get completely overwhelmed with adding a CTA and what that should look like on an email. So yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah. So let me make it simple. So one, e one email, one CTA, um, unless it's your like first initial welcome email, then you can do like your Facebook group and then like your Instagram or your Facebook group and a podcast or something like that. But generally speaking, one CTA per one email. And within this, what I like to do is when I'm outlining my emails, I actually first take a look um, specifically at what the purpose is, the three kind of main points, and then the CTA. So that way, as I'm writing the email, it makes it a lot easier to link the two together without all the pressure of like, oh my gosh, I just wrote this like email and I didn't even add in a call to action. Like how am I supposed to add in a call to action now for my application if I've like already gone all the way through this story, right? So having the outline is so incredibly important. So that way when you're writing, you know what to expect next. But also within this as well too, I like to actually integrate my CTA um, within the copy. Um, anytime that I mention I have a program or mention I have an offer, or if I mention any of the things or mention I have a toddler, I actually link to it. And the thing is, is I found that by going through the process of actually hyperlinking in the text of like, if I ever mentioned something, even if the email's purpose is not to actually sell them into it, just I mentioned it, I'm like, oh yeah, like, you know, I created the email strategy lab because I was, you know, I saw people were struggling with X, Y, Z. So like, that's a great way to just like link over without it being like, oh my gosh, here's the CTA. You can do, use buttons at the end. I do like to use buttons, especially if you're trying to visually draw somebody's attention. Um, but I think the most important part is making sure your segue works. Like actually making sure it's not just like, oh, I told you the story about my two-year-old being cray cray, but then I go into like, here's my email strategy lab offer. Like make sure the two connect, make sure you bridge the two 
And a lot of times it's just by, you know, simply stating like, yeah, like, you know, just as I was explaining, like, it's, it's really easy to get overwhelmed when you're trying to do a podcast episode with a two-year-old in the background. (laughs) And you may feel the same exact way when it comes to your email marketing, where you feel like, oh my gosh, how am I supposed to concentrate on writing these emails and know what to say? Well, my two-year-old is playing the bongos in the background. Like that is a very good way to be able to put the two together where you're telling a story, but then you're like, oh, I can totally relate to that. That makes so much sense. Yeah. I love the way you write your emails with stories in it as well. And your videos with your little boy are so Uh cute. (laughs) I'm always like, oh, I love him. He's so cute. Uh, So I love that you include all of that stuff in in your marketing as well. With somebody, because I get a lot of people ask me questions like, how much should I share about my personal life? And I know you're very open about your personal life. And and I am too on social media as well on my emails. Um, I even told my, my email list about my sister's wedding a couple of years ago. So like, I'm very open, but how much yeah. should people share on their emails? Honestly, I, it's very personal, right? In terms of with how much you feel comfortable sharing, what you want to share. I was not open when I first started my business. Like you couldn't even find a picture of me on my website. At, like I had like a little tiny block on my about page and that was it. So I have, I, I've been on both sides of it where I've not wanted to share anything versus now I'm just like, okay, here's, here's my life. Like it's crazy, but like, it's, it's my life. So the biggest rule of thumb that I've been told is to make sure that especially if it's more so of like trauma or tragedy or something that's not like fun like a wedding or like your crazy two-year-old share from a scar not a wound because what ends up happening is that when you share from a scar you have a different perspective as opposed to if you're going through something so if you're going through um you know something hard like you had a death in your family you know share what you want to share share with what you're comfortable sharing. Don't feel like you have to overshare whatsoever. Uh, because a lot of times when you start to overshare, that's when it can just be like really icky and gross. And you're just like, Oh, I don't know how I feel about this. So share what you're wanting to share, share from a scar, not a wound, and just be as open as you want to be. Like, don't feel like you have to censor yourself. Don't feel like you have to, you know, share all of the details. Like again, share what you want to share and just be comfortable knowing that like what you shared was totally completely fine. I like that saying, share from a scar, not a wound. I've never heard that before, but it's really powerful. Um, I think people get a lot from that. That's really awesome. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, Okay. So how any other last minute tips that you want to share with the audience that we've gone through so much? I feel like I've cracked your brain open, but is there (laughs) anything else that you're like, they have to know this? Oh my gosh. I think at the end of the day, when it comes down to it, it's really, again, just about intention. What is the intention behind sending the email? And when you're going through and even planning out for a launch or anything, whether, you know, it could just be, you know, your monthly campaigns. Again, think about what is it that my person needs to hear? What what can I do to help set them up to be my next best client? And when you start to actually shift that perspective from your emails being all about you, being all about what you're doing or what you're promoting and very much more focused on like, how can I serve you? What can I do to support you this week? It changes the game. It completely changes the game within how your relationships show up in email, how they show up online and how they all coincide together. Um, and not not only that, email is the best way to be able to remind people of you, I think, because especially with the social media algorithm, like I miss so much stuff and it's not on purpose. It's just like, I get so many notifications and I have so many different things going on. Email is literally the best way because they see your name. They see your name pop up, whether they get the notification or not, like they see your name and they're reminded, oh my gosh, Ashley DeLuca, the avocado girl. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> And it's a great way to be able to stay top of mind, to be able to remind people. And it's a great driving force of like, oh my gosh, yeah, she has a podcast. Like I totally forgot about that. And then they'll hop over to Apple and then they'll pull up my podcast and they'll start listening to it. So sometimes the wins aren't necessarily because they opened or even clicked in the email. The win comes from you sending the email and reminding them that you exist and that your offer is available to them. I love that. And just from sending the email, they don't even have to open it. They're just like, oh, yeah, that's that chick again. And next yeah. time you post, they were like, oh, yeah, I need to listen to that podcast or I need to go and check out her group, or whatever it is. I love that. Send exactly. more emails, people. Send more emails. Yes. <laughs> yes. The moral 100%. of the story. <laughs> okay. Where can people connect with you? Where can they find you? How can they buy from you? 
Yeah, a hundred percent. So you can find me anywhere online at Ashley K. DeLuca. Um, I hang out a lot on Facebook and Instagram. Those are my two main platforms. Um, and then I also have a podcast as well too called the communication conversation, um, where we talk about all things, email marketing, communicating intentionally with your audience and all of that really fun stuff. And I also have an offer called the email strategy lab, where essentially I help you outline your strategy for your emails. You go off and write the emails and then you come back and I actually implement the emails for you, making you, um, feel super confident in what you're sharing, knowing that you have your strategy in place, knowing that it aligns with your marketing and your launch and all of the things and having someone be able to provide you feedback on what you've written. So that way you become, become a better email marketing writer for yourself, but then also too, you can learn and educate yourself on um, email best practices without the fear of like, oh my gosh, am I doing this right? Um, and you can find that over on my website, which is ashleykdeluca.com. Yay. And I will put all the links down below on the show notes. And I can highly recommend Ashley's strategy sessions because all my one-on-one -on -one clients have them as well as myself. So I can highly recommend to definitely check those out because she is a fountain of knowledge. So oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're such an awesome. I love you and your clients. They are seriously the best. Oh, thank you. And they absolutely love you too. So it works both <laughs> ways. Yes. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us today. I really, really appreciate it. I know I have cracked open your brain and we have given so much knowledge to the listeners today. So thank you. Thank you so much. And make sure that you hit the subscribe button and join us next week for another episode of scaling with disha thank you so much for tuning in today and i really hope that you genuinely learned something from today's episode if you found this episode useful then please hit the subscribe button and leave us a review i personally read each and every one until next time bye <laughs>